Amen. I am so excited to be here. I had a delay getting in town, but coming back home, anytime I get a chance to come back to Texas, uh, where my roots are. But this trip was a, a little more special to me because the topic in which uh, I was asked to speak about. Um, over my lifetime, I grew up in a time where normal meant something. I grew up in a time where things were black and white. Everyone didn't want to sit in the gray. And so as I'm flying in, I'm thinking to myself, what is really going on with our nation? When we talk about policy, when we talk about trying to get to the root cause of our issues, what are we really saying? What are we talking about? What conversations are we having in our homes? Could the conversations that we have in our homes translate to conversations in other homes? The language that we speak amongst ourselves, can we speak that same language across populations in America? Think about that. The words that we use, do they mean the same to us as they do to those that really need to hear them? So for the purposes of this short talk, I'm not going to say Democrat or Republican. I'm not going to say left or right. I'm not going to say liberal or conservative. I'm going to say light or darkness. Amen? Amen. I'm going to use the same definition for good, as I use with my 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way up to 15, 16 year olds at my ministry. We say the definition of good is simply this, pleasing God. Can I get an amen? amen? Pleasing God. And so taking that, now we can start to talk. When we look at our society today, fatherlessness, has ravaged us. And when I say fatherlessness, I don't mean just fathers in the home. I'm talking about father in the spirit as well. When you look at a society where all of a sudden, when I was in high school, church participation was almost 70% in the high 60s. That's when I was in high school. I'm only 43. Today, it's less than 47%. The last poll after... Coronavirus, in some places, is less than 40% of people that even attend the church once a year. And so now you take a population, and in the United States of America, we have 18.5 million fatherless kids. I spoke at a life event in Texas last week, and I did some research with my good friends at AFPI. 2.5 million fatherless kids in the state of Texas alone. And so what does that mean? It means that we are trying to raise an orphan generation. The topic of this discussion right now is kingdom over culture. Kingdom over culture. But how do we get there? The word of God told us, pure religion and undefiled before God is this, to visit the fatherless and the widow in their trouble. The word of God tells us to defend the fatherless in Isaiah 1 and 17. And so when we start to look at all of the root causes of the so many different things that are happening in our society, we talk about education. How hard is it to educate a fatherless kid? Particularly when now this kid doesn't have a father in the flesh or a father in the spirit. So when we talk about light and darkness, those that are on the side of darkness start telling those same children that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. Folks on the side of darkness start telling these same children that they can kneel at our flag and not stand. Guys on the, and girls on the same side of darkness can tell children not to respect law enforcement officers. Isaiah 5 and 20 says, Woe to those who see good as evil 
and evil is good. That is what we're facing today. Truth has lost this. It's lost scripture. And so we dance around and we try to respect everyone. But at the end of the day, if we don't get the word of God back in our schools, and I'm not talking about lightly. I'm talking about the authority of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we don't bring that authority back to our society, we will never give a father to the fatherless. Those orphans will continue to start running for elected office. Those orphans will run your government agencies. Those orphans will start to determine the direction of our nation. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what's happening right before our eyes. And so this battle is not a physical battle. It's a spiritual one. And the only way we fight that spiritual battle is by putting on our full armor of God. And so this is a time where the saints must lock arms. The believers must start lifting up men and women of God into these positions. When we give our endorsement, when we give our dollars, when we give our support to those, let's follow scripture. And the Bible clearly says, do not yoke with non-believers. The results are in front of us. We see it. The Holy Spirit is talking to many of us right now in this room. We see it. We feel it. We know it. We have to claim it in the name of Jesus. So kingdom over culture. Kingdom over culture. Kingdom over culture. We must take our children, our, our grandchildren, our school districts, and we must start demanding that we get the gospel back in. And so, as I close, I just want to remind us all what the word of God says. First Peter 4 and 8 tells us very clearly that our charity covers a multitude of sins. Our charity covers a multitude of sins. We have a sinful generation. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. But we've lost that perspective of teaching charity. See, the word of God has been translated so much. You, you read the old text, charity means love. And the way we love one another is we, that we must serve one another. So all these fatherless homes, particularly starting in Texas, the church must rise up. 2.5 million fatherless kids, all of us from Texas. I don't know if you, how many of us in here are from Texas? Because I'm born and bred. And I don't know about y'all, but that hurts my spirit. That hurts my spirit to know that we have 2.5 million fatherless kids in our great state. That's a crisis. And it's up to us as the church, as believers, to do something about it. We want to go before our Father and, and hear that well done. And we're going to all do a little bit more to help these orphans and these widows. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you. First off, Brooke, I think that was the fastest speech I ever gave. You know, he told me 12 minutes, and I, and I was looking for the clock, and I couldn't find it. I said, you know what? The Spirit said, all right, you're done. Okay, well, we are, we are amazingly running on time. I know I, th I saw I've got the agenda right here, and they said, well, he's going to talk for 10 minutes. I've never heard Jack talk for 10 minutes before. <laughs> Wow, but miracles do happen, Jack. Thank you. Uh, no, you are such an inspiration to me. And one of the things when we were in the White House, I was always amazed at the people that were willing. I mean, listen, showing up at a Trump White House event meant getting canceled. Um, we saw it firsthand by so many people, media, tech, academia, et cetera. 
But I think for those um, leaders like you, Jack, who come from a community that historically has not been aligned, A, with the conservative movement, but certainly with someone like you know President Trump, um, for better or worse, what was that like? And, and how did you sort of come to the realization that you needed to run into the arena and toward the ideals that you believed in, regardless of the pushback you would get? Well, f for me, I had, first off, never voted for a Republican in my life. Um, and I was in a house where if you say the word Republican, they look at you crazy, <laughs> right? I mean, literally, and this is culture, right? It's, 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 it's not right, it's not righteous, actually, but I was taught that a Republican was only rich white people. That's what I was taught as a kid. All when you're a baby, you're growing up, that's what someone's putting in your ear. And then, all of a sudden, and I was a big Barack Obama supporter, then all of a sudden, the back end of his presidency, he started doing some really weird stuff. And I just, it opened my eyes. It actually brought me to God. And when I saw Donald Trump, the reason why I supported him is because what he was saying aligned so much with scripture. And I didn't care about what the man's past was, right? Because, I mean, I read a Bible that's half of it was written by King David, who did a lot of sins. A lot of people did. So I, I, tried, I tried to spiritually a, a address that. And I think that's the reason, Brooke, I was able to continue to push through all the persecution. That was the reason I was able to go into communities that probably wanted to kill me and talk about President Trump. And, you know, it was tough. It was hard. But I think that staying rooted in that truth, knowing, knowing that I was on the side uh, of Father God uh, when I was supporting President Trump, I think that gave me um, the energy and the power and the grace to continue on. One of the uh, amazing things about Jack Brewer is I, I feel like I've got lots of ideas and energy all the time. I think Jack actually runs past me. Uh, and there are so many projects you're working on. You've got a school. You've got a ministry. You've got a foundation. Uh, at the America First Policy Institute, you're basically running two centers. Uh, you are creating the Athletes for America. And I want to talk very quickly about the culture, which you mentioned. And I think that for many years at TPPF, we've talked about this. I think that the last administration, we were able to break through in a way to black community, the Hispanic community, blue collar workers, in which our side hadn't been able to do in, in a long time, arguably ever for the minority communities. And it was remarkable. But now it's up to us to keep broadening that tent and building that tent. And I think that your work is really remarkable. Will you talk a little bit about our vision for your Athletes for America and your Pray to Play initiative uh, that we, I think, are going to be unveiling perhaps in Texas. I don't know if you're up to speed on that yet, but okay, good, in, in October. But I think that going to the culture and directly to the people and making the case that and, and to your point, it's not Democrat or Republican. It's it's dark versus light and how we continue to move that out. Yeah, so uh, obviously playing in the National Football League, I was blessed to be captain on three teams. Um, and so that that al allowed me to, to just understand sports in the sense of, you know, I was a mentor to so many athletes. So until they come to me with problems, and still to this day, I mean, I'm, I just helped get one of my dear friends – get his sentence cut down. He was going to prison who played with me. Uh, and so in doing so, so many different things in that regard, being looked at as a mentor, um, I, I just, I really want to bring, Brooke, what we've done at AFPI to that base. Because I know deeper in most of professional athletes' souls, they love this country, they love family, and they love God. And so when you have people that really have that in their spirit, it's important to try to figure out how do we communicate directly into that population because they have influence. And if we really want uh, to, to, to save our nation and reestablish uh, all those uh, God-given principles that we were founded on, we need to make sure that we can take that population and have voices that are strong. Uh, and so that's, that's what the vision for the Athlete for America Coalition is, is just to empower those athletes that already have it in them. Maybe educate them. Maybe, maybe they will see the light uh, more through our work and through um, our statistics and data and being able to show people the truth. 
I think that's really important because the media has been able to manipulate so many minds and ha has been able to portray people um, as things that they're not uh, and really change reality. And I talk about this sometimes when I, with my kids at the school is that definitions of words have changed now. They've been able to literally go in and take foundational words and vocabulary and change the meaning of them. And when you're dealing with children or kids or people that are in the developmental stage and, and you put those type of lies into their spirit, it's really hard to change it. And that's what's happened across the world, but particularly with professional athletes because the spotlight's on you. And so your demand from the community and your family are, are, are greater. Uh, and so uh, too much is given, uh, you know, we, we have to empower them mm -hmm. to be able to um, really become our allies in this fight for America. Well, I, I think that's right. And when I was in Washington, I was working really hard to identify and build a uh, structure around this whole idea. And right when COVID hit, March of 2020, we had begun um, our Opportunity Now summits around the country and going directly into these areas, directly to Detroit, not the suburb of Detroit, but into inner city Detroit. The hood. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but those are our people. Right. Perhaps more, they just don't know it yet. And so that, I believe, is the next great mountain that we have been called to climb. And I'm actually very encouraged about it because I think with leaders like you, Jack, we're going to climb it and we're going to bring so many people and set them free right. uh, in such, a, such an amazing way. So I am, is Senator Lee here yet or am I still stretching? <gasps> Senator Lee is here. Oh, Senator Lee, welcome to Texas. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, why don't we wrap up with this, Jack? I think that uh, when you look at sort of the the mountains to climb ahead, and I think back specifically, your work on fatherhood has been remarkable. Your partnership with Governor DeSantis in Florida, I think, is really an amazing uh, opportunity that we will be able to spread around the country. But you were persecuted from The View, the very popular TV show, by, was it Joy Bear, Joy who went after you? Joy Reid. Joy Reid. I, I get them all confused. But literally on her TV show to millions of people, she calls out Jack and his school and the students that he took to support Governor DeSantis and the, the partnership on the Fatherhood Project. So talk a little bit about that, yeah. how we work through that, and then any kind of lasting words of encouragement for this crowd. Yeah, amen. Yeah. So th this is the battle that we face. Uh, I run a school down in South Florida where literally 90% of my kids are fatherless. 99.9% um, .9 of them are black, which means all of them are black. <laughs> 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 and it's, a, it's an area where you never think that real poverty exists. M most of my kids um, live in two-bedroom apartments with 12, 14 people. Um, and so obviously, you know, you think about being a 12, 13-year-old girl going through puberty, having to share bathrooms. and I mean, it's, it's like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've been a real big advocate, particularly down in Florida and across the country on fatherlessness. And so um, I, I literally helped with the fatherhood bill that the Governor DeSantis was, was pushing down in Florida because just like Texas, we have a fatherlessness crisis. And so he was able to allocate over $75 million. Some people say it's social social program. Well. If people are that poor, they got you got to help with the kids, and so that's what Governor DeSantis did. Uh, he didn't care about Democrat and Republican, but I sent my kids, um, all of them. He invited them to come and actually sign the bill with them, and so they're so excited driving there. I'm talking to them. I'm like, listen, you're gonna be with the governor. I was like, you're gonna be able to use this on your resume forever. <laughs> I was like, some of you may even be able to get a letter from him. You right? You gonna get a picture with him? So they're so excited, and then. Literally, before the night was over, they had called me a child abuser, that I was using my, these black kids as props, and calling Governor DeSantis racist. Mm -hmm. And so that one hurt me. It hurt me a lot because, man, I worked so hard to get these kids a new life. I literally got all of them on mine. I, I, I feed them every day. I pick them up during Christmas. 
I got to buy for 60, 70. <laughs> I've been there. It's amazing. I visited the school and met the kids. It really is incredible what you've done. Yeah. So I, I, that one, that one hurt, but it, it, it really prepared, prepared me for a battle and it made it clear uh, just how dark that side has become. Uh, and so uh, it, 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 it has encouraged us, and so as I as I end this talk, I just I encourage us all to to know wh what we're facing right now and who who we're trying to stand against, uh, and empower those voices like Brooke uh, and America First Policy Institute has empowered me. She's allowed me to take my sinners and literally almost do what I want. I can't really say that, but <laughs> she's given me the freedom. Because she sees that she has a fighter that will go into the community that some people won't go into. But that's what we got to do. We got to change the way we play. Forget about the power. Let's start being really for the people. Let's empower the voices that are already doing the stuff that needs to be done. We people in our country know how to fix the issues. We don't need just big talking heads to oversee things. We need people that are going to put the words into the works, being workmen, being workmen. It's our works, it's not our words. And so, Brooke, I applaud you for having my back in doing that. Um, if I ask Brooke, hey, I want to go into the prisons, she lets me take it. I, I took about five little white girls to the prison with me from America First Policy <laughs> Institute. And Brooke told me I could do it, and it changed their lives. It's that type of stuff. We have to speak into those communities and, and, and really do the works with our hands. But I applaud you, Brooke. And again, it's an honor to speak here, um, knowing what the Te Texas Public Policy Foundation has done and the impact it's had around the country uh, for, from a, a boy from Grayvine, Texas, to be sitting up here speaking at an event like this. For me, it's humbling. I don't, I don't take any of this for granted. Every time I go on Fox News, I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every time I get an opportunity to speak anywhere, I'm humbled by it, man. I mean, God has been so good to me and to this country, um, and I'll take my last breath fighting for what's right, fighting for this nation, and, and fighting for uh, God's kingdom. Thank you. God bless America, and God bless Jack Brewer.